Hello and welcome everyone to Facebook Live. So far we have about nine people joining us live and welcoming everyone into the room. Thank you so much for being here. We do appreciate people who join us live and those coming late, don't worry, it's recorded. You can go back and watch it at any time. It'll be on our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel in perpetuity. So you can watch it numerous times and listen to our esteemed guest speakers. Today we have Georgia and Thurman. They are UC Master Gardener um, volunteers of Riverside County. I am Lauren Snowden. I am a UC Master Gardener volunteer and also the statewide training coordinator for the UC Master Gardener program. And you're joining me from my um, home in Yuba City. So thank you again. And we do have a program here, or I should say a competition every three years in the Master Gardener program that asks for counties to submit their best projects forward. And I would like to say that um, this one submitted by Riverside County is amazing. It did win first place, and you are here to hear all about it today, about how it came to fruition, about how they went through and brought back to life a garden in an area of food raising that was fallow for a while and how the success has continued and is in transition out into being run by um, members of the community. Thank you again for joining us live. Um, we are gonna hold all questions to the end, but since we are live, what you can do is write in the comment section. You can practice right now by writing in the comment section and letting us know where you're joining us from. And if you just have accolades or wanna say hi to someone else, you can put that in the comments as well. Or if you have a question, you can put it in there and we will address them at the end. And we are happy to have questions about um, the project itself, about how you can connect with the Master Gardener program, or if you um, just have a gardening question, we can hook you up with your local Master Gardeners uh, to get that question answered. So thank you again, everyone, for joining. We are happy to be here today, and we are going to go ahead and transition this presentation over to Thurman and Georgia. Georgia, take it away. Good morning. It's our pleasure to be with you this morning. We were asked to give one interesting fact gardening wise about ourselves. And I will tell you that I only plant things, plants, trees, shrubs, whatever, that will bloom. That's how I've planted three different yards. Now I'm in my third and that's what I plant. So Thurman, what do you do? Well, uh, I'm Thurman, and I live up in an unincorporated area above Cherry Valley in Riverside County with my wife, Marilyn, who's also a master gardener. Uh, I have two dogs, uh, Mauna Kea and Ikaika, and I have two uninvited rabbits, uh, Sneaky and Peaky, <laughs> and I live among 50 trillion, 100 billion trillion microorganisms my garden in the front is all landscape for waterficial landscaping. I have a little stream that runs through it. I have turf, I have uh, a small orchard, and I have lavender, roses, and everything that blooms. So that's what my garden looks like. Sounds pretty cool. Well, let's start our presentation. Saboba, the winter place. Since time immemorial, the people of Saboba lived within the present day San Jacinto Valley and surrounding areas. The Saboba Indian Reservation, home to both Luisiano and Cahuilla people, is nestled in the foothills of the San Jacinto Mountains, near the city of San Jacinto, Southern California, in Riverside County. The Saboba website tells us 
the Saboba people farmed land that was irrigated with surface water from the San Jacinto River, two of its tributary streams, Poppet and Indian Creeks, and from more than 40 perennial springs. These water sources sustain gardens, animals, and orchards. However, by 1899, the tribe's gravi gravity floor flow irrigation system became useless due to the upstream diversions of the major tributaries by settlers. Consequently, their food production declined. Today, the reservation covers 9,000 acres and its current enrollment is approximately 876 adults governed by an elected five-member tribal council. The one-acre Saboba Cultural Garden comprises two components, showcasing native plants on the one side and seasonal produce on the other, both highlighting the significance and uses of plants that are native to the region while providing nutritious food for community members. The Saboba Cultural Garden's mission is to develop a cultivation system that is grounded in traditional tribal knowledge and connection to the land, while promoting food sovereignty and providing accessibility to health and wellness for its members. Now the cultural garden supplies nutritious food for daily lunches for preschool students and the elders. The music you hear in the background is called bird songs that are common in the region. The bird songs chronicle the history of the Kawea people, including their creation and subsequent journey in search of their homelands, just as birds return to their homelands. These songs are sung to remind the people of their history so that will not be forgotten. The instruments are handmade rattles made from gourds and seeds created by each singer to make a unique sound. Welcome to the Saboba Reservation. Understanding their past and respecting their tradition. This is, was not just an ordinary garden. This was a sovereign nation. So being Native Hawaiian, I understood the importance of knowing this. So by getting to know them, it was like a brotherhood and understanding their ways. One of the things that we did as we put in about four rows of corn one day, um, joking around, being guys in the shade, around 11.30, 12 o'clock, a coyote appeared. And someone said, it's a good time to plant corn and harvest corn. Then I looked at him and I said, who told you that? And he says, oh, my dad, my grandpa. It's just something that was said. And, you know, ironically, it's true. That was the best time to plant corn and to grow corn or harvest corn in that region. When I became a part of this project, when a rattlesnake was found in the garden, it wasn't killed. It was captured and replaced back on the reservation near a ravine. While we worked in the garden, they would take time to look up in the sky to see a hawk soaring and said, the hawk is full and life is good. I've always been guided by elders, and one of my favorite statement, uh, state man, was Winston Churchill. A pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity. An opportunist sees opportunity in every difficulty. And it is so true, and it's happened so many times here at Saboba. So I ask you, is this an opportunity 
or a difficulty. The collaboration. This is the first step of this beautiful story. I was called by the Riverside University Health System to uh, go to Saboba to work on their school and children's garden. And I said, I'm sorry, but that's out of my department. Let me get a hold of the coordinator. So I called Joni and Joni said, yeah, we'd love to go there, but I'm not that familiar with soil and irrigation. So Thurman, can you come with me? I said, sure. Well, there goes an opportunity again. So one morning we showed up at the parking lot, uh, Laurie Brinicky from uh, the health system and um, Hosea, myself and Joni. So we walked into this room with a huge table and people were gathering around and we kind of, you know, had a little small chit chat. And so the meeting started, the chairman called the meeting to order and they went over business. And about 20 minutes into the meeting, uh, the chairman said, uh, we have a special guest with us today. Uh, we have the 4-H club here. And I'm looking around the room and Hosea nudges me and says, it's you, Thurman. I said, I'm not with the 4-H, I'm with the Master Gardener program. And she looked at me with a blank face and said, what's the difference? And everybody in the room knew the difference. So we sl slowly apologized and said, well, I'm sorry, but we were scheduled to have the 4-H club here. And so we said, okay, well, not a problem. Apologies all over the room. So the opportunity was slipping away and it was getting very difficult. But so I stood up and I turned and there was a gentleman standing next to me and I said, do you have a garden here? And he says, yeah, you wanna see it? I said, sure. So I told Laurie, uh, Joni and Hosea about the garden and they said, we wanna go too. So they jumped in my car and uh, we followed Joe who is pictured here uh, up to the garden. And this again was an opportunity. What they saw is this. Now, who are they? I don't know who they were, but I know there were several people who tried to grow things here or made an attempt to. Um, and so uh, it wasn't doing well, there was issues. When I looked at the garden, it's not what I saw, it's what I didn't see. What I didn't see was the owl in the soil. So I looked at it, I said, I think I can fix this. No, I know I can fix this because I have over 250 master gardeners that are behind me. So anytime I take on a project or look at a project, I know that we have master gardeners that are specialty specialists in so many different uh, subjects, not to mention the fact that we are well connected with several partners throughout our community. So about a week later, uh, we had another meeting up at the uh, a garden and the question was posed, can you help us? If so, how? So I explained to them what I was gonna do. So I'll share that with you. preparing the land and the soil. The first thing I had to do was to break up the hard clay. So I added oxygen by going 18 inches into the compact soil and we went back and forth, north, south, east, west, and brought it all up. I then encouraged them to add water to the soil, but I wanted it added uh, with overhead sprinklers to encourage uh, the, dormant, the dormant microorganisms in the soil to slowly activate itself. And then I wanted to apply living organisms to create a biodiversity in the soil. This was the owl I was talking about. Uh, 
about a week and a half to two weeks later, uh, we brought in 20 tons of green manure compost from Burtec. And uh, it was uh, something that was delayed because everything here is organic. And I wanted to look at the uh, batch report. And the two batches that were ready to go, I was not satisfied because of the high salt content. So when the salt content got down to the level that was acceptable for me, um, we went ahead and brought it in and uh, we started. This is what the garden looked like after we uh, ripped it open, uh, mixed in our uh, green manure compost, and then we used a mulch form of the compost to create a, a level underneath the mulch to create a vast community of microorganisms, um, healthy microorganisms. And I encourage overhead watering. I wanted the water to go slowly seeping into the soil, creating a compost tea. I wasn't in any rush. I was under the impression that we'd probably be planting in early spring of 2020. Uh, by our networking, I knew we had to add nitrogen to the soil. So I reached out to another community par partner who was a neighbor of the Saboba tribe, but they didn't know each other. So it was a great thing for me to at least create a bridge between uh, Scott's Dairy and the reservation. Uh, Brad Scott was a, a friend of mine that we met through uh, other uh, projects that uh, we collaborated in. And I like Scott's uh, dairy, uh, and I love, loved his manure because Scott grows all of his alfalfa and it's uh, grown organically. So I gave Scott a call and I said, uh, Scott, can we uh, get some uh, uh, manure from you? And he said, sure, Thurman, uh, give me a couple of weeks because I'm harvesting my uh, uh, fields right now and I'll get back to you. And I said, I need something around six months or older. He says, not a problem. Uh, so we got about two tons of uh, this uh, dairy manure, brought it to the farm, and slowly started mixing it in with our green manure compost. Teaching and growing. That's what master gardeners do. We teach. I wanted to bring in and teach compost. I didn't want everybody to think compost came off the back of a truck. And I wanted them to appreciate compost by making it. I wanted to introduce vermiculture because the vermiculture would tie in what the compost does because what, when compost is breaking down, we can't see it. But when we're doing vermiculture, at least we can see the worms and we can see what they're doing. And the third thing that I really needed to have on the reservation was better irrigation. Everything was moving on so smoothly. Until I was told that if we didn't have something growing in the next 60 to 90 days, they would not get funded for next year. So everything was in a panic mode. I called uh, another friend of ours. You know, we're well connected here in the Master Garden program, uh, uh, Scott Burnt. And uh, I say, hey, Scott, do you have any seedlings left? It's midsummer. Uh, the shelves are empty. He says, uh, let me check. Uh, I think I have some at Sherman Indian School. Let me check. I'll, go, I'll get back with you tomorrow. I said, fine. He called me back that afternoon and says, Thurman, I got about 120 seedlings, but they're in real bad shape. Uh, I'll take them anyway, Scott. So I ran down there, I picked them up, and I brought them home. And I said, Scott, what I owe you? He says, I need some sweat equity from you later on down the road, so I'll, I'll collect from you later. I said, sure. So I took them home, and I gave it to my lovely wife <laughs> for her to bring it back to life. 
And she did. And in about two weeks, we brought it down to the reservation. And this is not what I was picturing when I first thought of this project. So we had to uh, get it in the ground uh, as soon as possible. And we taught them the proper way of, of planting these seedlings. I wasn't taking any chances, so I was throwing everything in the ground, hoping that we would get something to, to pop up. As you can see, this irrigation system that we have here just doesn't work. Uh, there's no field capacity. There's no balance. It's either wet or dry. So we had a hard time getting everything in the ground. It was messy, but we got it accomplished. Now we had a chance to start our composting. We took a lot of natural resources from the reservation. Uh, we had the wood chipper that we chipped the natural uh, deadwood from the reservation. Uh, we added some uh, sterminor compost uh, to this, just a little bit. And uh, uh, we asked people to bring in their fruits and vegetables that were, that we're not using. Uh, we added some alfalfa. Uh, this created a, a mix. And this was the fun part. This is where I really got to know the tribal members, uh, joking around, just, you know, relaxing, having a good time, bringing the tractor in and turning uh, the compost. I didn't get the message through. I kept talking and talking, but nobody was listening until this. When I stuck the thermometer into the first pile, and about a couple hours later, it started to move. Then the questions started coming. What's going on? Why is it getting warm? Why did we put the pile here? Et cetera, et cetera. So this was a great learning tool uh, to use. When the thermometer got up to 150, they were, almost, I won't say it, but they were taking bets on how high it would go. I, uh, it got up to 155, and I said, when it gets to 160, we don't want it to go any higher. So, uh, and it got up to about 155, and it stayed there for a long time. And then I said, well, right now we need to sustain between 150, 155 as long as we can. But when it starts to get down to 120, we need to redo the process. Now, up here on the mound, uh, we did a mound a day, uh, excuse me, a week. And every week we came back after we had two mounds, we'd combine the two and we kept the process going. This is something I did not have to monitor because they enjoyed watching the thermometer go up and down. With all this hard work, this is what we created. This is their compost. And one of them came up to me and said, Mr. Thurman, our compost is better than Vertex. I said, absolutely it's better because we have two ingredients that Vertec doesn't give, and that is love and sweat. The next transition was vermiculture. Introducing vermiculture to the tribe was important because it was a connection between composting and the microorganisms that they couldn't see. Again, networking, I called on my friend, Danny Echeverria, um, who was also Native American. And I said, can you come in and bring in your knowledge on vermiculture? And he wasn't a professor. He's not, he's just a worm whisperer. He knows what he does. And I just thought that it would, he would bond well uh, with the Sabobo tribe and he did. Not only did he uh, teach us or teach the, the group about vermiculture, he told us where we could get some scrap wood, these two by fours, and uh, for free. We picked them up and then he came by and he showed us how to build one. And then the tribal members came in and built the rest. I then contacted a uh, community garden in Corona, which was closing. And I asked the guy, hey, what happened to that guy who does vermiculture there? And he gave me his numbers and I called him and he says, uh, I said, uh, what are you going to do with your worms? He says, I'm trying to get rid of them. I said, how much do you have left? He says, I have about a half a yard. I said, I'll take them. He said, all right, come down and get them. 
So I went down there and we, we picked them up and brought it to the reservation. One key factor here is if you take a look at the bottom below the tray, after we're picking out the worms and we're grading this, this is your um, the um, castings that we were able to gather, the worm, the worm poop. And we collected about five, I think maybe five or six trays here. And then we spread five trays out in the garden. And then I asked them to uh, give me one tray and I uh, took it and I soaked the uh, cardboard um, and laid over it. And I said, I want you for the next 10 days to just keep this moist. And they did. After 10 days, I went and got it, pulled it out and brought everybody around and I lifted up the cardboard and there must have been a thousand worms there. So this was teaching 101. I said, all of the five trays that we entered into the soil 10 days ago, this is what it produced. And now we're gonna put this back into the soil. So this is a really great a teaching tool that we taught them about vermiculture and um, how just the worm castings alone will produce eggs that we can't see. So back to irrigation. You know, I, I talked to Lauren and she says they do uh, trench irrigation and they have all this fancy uh, stuff that uh, ir uh, regulates the water. Um, they didn't have it here. So we had to find a better way of irrigating the fields. So remember the guy that I called for the seedlings, Scott? Well, uh, I went down to pay my sweat equity back to him a couple of hours and we're uh, filling in his seed plugs in. And after we we're done, he said, hey, would you like to come and uh, check my farm out? I said, sure. So when I went over to his farm, uh, I, I noticed his irrigation system and I said, Scott, uh, where'd you get your system from? And he said, I, I applied for a grant and I, and I got it. And I said, boy, this is really do well at Saboba. He says, uh, can you give me the contact? Uh, where we can get this. And he says, you know what? I have an extra spool I'm not going to use. And he says, I'm going to donate it to the tribe. I said, under one condition. He says, I said, I'm going to donate it. I said, no, under one condition. And he said, what's the condition? I said, I want you to show us how to install it. He said, that's all right. That's fine. The only thing I need is for them to supply me with the fixtures. So that's what we did. Scott also showed us to, uh, how to put the spool in a wheelbarrow with a broomstick so we could uh, run, it, uh, run it out easily. This was a lot of fun because now we had overhead irrigation and we had tape irrigation. It was fun for me too because I was learning as well on how this works. Now, every place that tape irrigation goes into this uh, pressure, water pressure is, is different. So we didn't know how it was going to work. So it was a, a matter of trial and error for a while, checking out the water pressure, adjusting the valves. You know, a big thank you to Scott. Uh, he's a great guy in the community, uh, does a lot of good things uh, for everyone. Uh, here he is uh, adjusting the valve. Each strip of tape has its own valve that we can adjust, shut off, um, and the irrigation is running. Over time, soil prep before planting, we lay, we're laying down our green and dairy manure on the top. You'll notice there's no tractor. We stopped running the tractor on the garden because it wasn't a good thing to have compressing the clay soil back into the ground. And then we would overhead water and then run our uh, tape down the rows that we created. Remember those seedlings that we brought down that uh, uh, my wife had to uh, uh, bring back to life and we planted it in, in the mud and everything else? Well, I can't remember this woman's name. Um, this is back in 2019. 
And nobody seems to remember her because I asked, who is she? What was her name? Well, anyway, she's holding up a zucchini. And that's the first harvest, the first thing we've harvested. And I don't know the last time, honestly, the last time they've had a harvest at the reservation. So in this thing here, we grew watermelon, zucchini, squash, some ac uh, acorn squash, and some eight balls. But this was the beginning. This was a pivotal turn. It can be, it will be, it is done. So as we played with this, the tape, uh, you could feel the enthusiasm uh, as we built uh, trellises for our bean crop or for our tomatoes. Uh, uh, you could feel the energy. They uh, wanted to put stakes down to identify what was planted in, in certain rows. Uh, people would come out and work in the garden uh, with a, a lot of humor, a lot of laughter, and a lot of learning. Thurman, it's Lauren. We're at 12.30, just to give you a time check. Thank you. Uh, now that we had things growing, I want you to take a good look at the garden, uh, the way it is set up, because I'm going to ask you uh, to remind yourself of what it looks like now and what it's look, going to look like uh, down the road. So 10 days of growth. You talk about energy picking up. It was great. Uh, the plants were happy, the, the birds were chirping, the irrigation was working, um, the weeds were in control, and everything was moving very rapidly to the positive. And then 10 days before harvest, we were checking our crop before we uh, uh, took out the corn. Uh, everything was looking really good. So over the last three years, we've had some great harvests, and it's all due to the hard work and dedication of the Sapoba uh, Canyon crew, uh, Eloy and Pogo. They did a fantastic job of creating this garden to where it is today. Take a look at that garden from the beginning to what it looks like now. They take pride in what they do. And look at what they grow. Uh, we have beets, we have uh, cucumbers, we have zucchinis, we have squash, we have lettuce. I'm just going to run through a few more pictures. Uh, we have um, acorn squash. The, um, the beets, we thought we were producing too many, but they were told by the head office, no, keep them coming because the younger generation was using the carrots and the beets for juicing. Now, I'm going to tell you, these uh, cantaloupes would not make it at Stater Brothers or Vaughn's because they don't, they're not pretty enough. But I'm going to tell you right now, this is the sweetest cantaloupe I ever had. And the watermelons grew like crazy. Um, and uh, it was just a, a great thing to just split open a watermelon in the middle of the day and just dig into it and get all messy. We, we introduced eggplant. One of the chefs had required that eggplant because he wanted to add it to their the diet and some of his sauces and things. But we noticed that uh, root uh, items Items grew very well, like carrots, uh, uh, sweet potatoes, yams. Uh, they just grew really, really well. We took orders from the chefs, uh, leeks, onions, uh, cabbage, cauliflower, uh, broccoli. Grew very, very well here. And this is Pogo. He's an elder that chooses to work at the garden. And uh, he's a wealth of knowledge. Uh, I enjoy talking to him, and, and uh, he and I just love to banter at each other. Peppers came in good, and they, they grow the peppers until uh, the first frost, and they leave them in the ground, and 
sometimes they come back and sometimes they don't, but it, it's fun to watch the, them try and experiment with different things. Tomatoes, in the beginning, I thought maybe we'd just do hybrids, but uh, I brought some chuck tomatoes, which is an heirloom that I grow near my house. And uh, they don't, you know, we, we were playing with this. Uh, the, the tomatoes are great. They don't look great, but they make great sauces. And we, you know, we cut them up and uh, eat them right there, right in the garden, or just crunch into them. So I guess you might say we have a great time at the reservation. We have a great harvest. But one of the best things that we harvested from this garden is Eloy Rodriguez. He is now a trainee in the University of California, Riverside, Master Gardeners of Riverside County's class. Uh, I spoke with Eloy last night. Uh, he will be, he's busy on his midterms and he's, uh, he's all excited about the Master Gardener program. Uh, and um, I, I'm just so proud. I feel like a proud papa having uh, Eloy join the program. Another thing that we did so that we could continue to teach how to rebuild the soil is we did a lot of cover crop. This this particular cover crop is a daikon, and we planted it in this particular section because of the hard clay soil. We wanted to expand it. Um, so we weed whacked it about three or four times uh, during the process and let the uh, droppings fall in and decompose naturally. And then when we are about a month out uh, before planting, we shut the water off and we let everything die back. And what happens is the water and moisture in the uh, actual root of the daikon, which can get rather large, just uh, slips back into the soil with all these nutrients. And then we'll come back and we'll till it back in about uh, three to six inches, um, uh, grate it back, water it, lay the tape, and plant. Pest management. Yeah, we do have pests there, and uh, that's, that was very interesting. Uh, the crew there does a great job in managing these pests. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a first line of defense. I'm a former uh, Army Ranger, and what we always did was we set a free fire zone uh, when we set up a camp. And I knew that all of our critters were coming from the east, and so we set up this so-called free fire zone. And if you look, notice the fence line, uh, this is our first perimeter. And inside the fence line uh, would be our second perimeter. And I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, so what was happening is uh, we wanted to control any pests or uh, critters that came in uh, the garden as much as possible. And we were hoping that they would come from the south side. Some of the things that we used at the garden was, you know, your standard uh, gopher traps. And then I uh, introduced the uh, gopher hawk uh, to them uh, and we uh, played with it. And it was very effective because the gopher hawk tells you when you have a gopher in the trap. And uh, so if we set the trap in the morning, like the, uh, the standard traps, uh, by nine o'clock, uh, we might have a gopher and we can reset it. Uh, it's been told to me that they've caught three gophers on the same trap in the same day. So we increased our uh, rate of ca catching gophers uh, quite a bit. Uh, the other trap in the middle, uh, uh, we have much larger traps there. It's for ground squirrels and any rabbits that dare walk into our garden. These are some of the uh, deterrents that we have. Um, on that fence line, that outer perimeter, I would use deer fencing or deer rabbit repellent, uh, which we sprayed around the garden. Uh, in the inner perimeter, uh, we would have a, a mixture of garlic, uh, minced garlic that we got from Costco, and we put it into a um, pump uh, spray container. 
with water um, and let it ferment and add some hot peppers in there. And it had a really strong pungent smell that would deter um, ground squirrels and rabbits because of, of, of their sensitive noses. Um, one thing that uh, uh, was a must in the garden was a trap at the bottom screen there where um, we wanted to know what was in our garden so that we could uh, do preventive maintenance. Um, another thing that we used was uh, boric acid. Uh, my wife would mix a uh, solution in the uh, jar here at the bottom of the screen with a cap on it. We drill a hole in the cap um, and the lower part of the uh, bottle will have the formula because the mafia, the ants, uh, we wanted to at least keep them in check. Uh, the uh, Eloy and his crew were told if you come across a bottle uh, with dead ants to pull it out. If you come across a bottle with no ants, pull it out. If you see a, the colony moving back and forth, leave the bottle there. Another deterrent for ground squirrels that we found was the uh, reflector tape that we tied on our bamboo uh, U-shaped hooks and let it flutter in the, uh, in the wind. Um, but the best deterrent that we had, believe it or not, was the coyote. We wanted the coyote to come and visit our garden. We wanted the coyote to uh, urinate in the garden and defecate if possible, uh, and he had fr uh, free will. Not at this garden, but another garden. I remember we sprayed artificial uh, coyote urine and that was a frenzy because most coyotes know their competitors smell, but when they smell something that they're not aware of, they really patrol. Some of the other items that we use in the garden besides the sticky traps, Um, we use uh, Sluggo Plus, uh, anything having to do with uh, um, a uh, 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 mm, caterpillar. Uh, we use BT, but now we've kind of switched over to Spinosad uh, due to the fact that uh, it has a longer life on it. We, we spray every 10 days instead of every two days. Uh, when we bring our seedlings down to the uh, garden, my wife usually sprays it uh, under the leaves with... Um, neem oil and water or just cooking oil and water uh, and we isolate these uh, ceilings in a group we spray under the leaves making sure that there's no hitchhikers on board before bringing them to the reservation now all of these items are organic approved or uh, omi approved or, or listed i should say Integrated pest management is practiced there. No pesticides or herbicides are used at the culture garden. All products used are OMI, OMRI listed. Organic material, material research institute, institute. Teaching and training. Here's my wife, Marilyn, with Eloy. He's, she's teaching them how to harvest lettuce uh, to, for better yield, uh, to prevent it from going to seed. Uh, she's, give, she's giving classes on growing short day onions and uh, garlic. Here we have Dave Freelinger and Martha Wynn training, uh, during their training class, doing uh, soil testing at the garden. And here's me giving uh, Lloyd some tough love on, on some things that we need to take care of. In the beginning, it was uh, I met with Lloyd, and we uh, planned um, a, our season's crop. We made sure that the soil was prepped and ready for planting. I encouraged Lloyd to uh, create a journal and to check on this, and it's, it's good reference to go back to uh, if in case uh, any problems uh, were, uh, we had, uh, checking the time, schedules, things like this. And now I'm not involved with this. It's all in him and his crew. Since we were recognized by the Master Garden Program as the winner's first place for the Search of Excellence uh, Conference, things have happened. 
Uh, we've been notified by the Indian Health uh, System Services. Um, there's an event coming up in March. Uh, we're negotiating or talking about putting an information table there. And uh, we're also talking about putting a presentation together so that we can have, uh, help other reservations duplicate what we did here at Saboba. We were, uh, the uh, state also recognized the Saboba Reservation. Here we have the tribal chairman, uh, Eloy Rodriguez, Jessica Valdez, and uh, Senator Ochoa's representative, William Boyd, uh, accepting this proclamation from the state. And here we are, Master Gardeners, at Senator Ochoa's um, uh, gathering uh, as she presented Uh, the proclamation to the Master Gardener Program. Uh, this is really uh, quite an honor and it's gonna lead and open a lot of doors in the future. As I said earlier, <clears throat> I want to help people that want to help themselves. A lot of times people will come up to me and says, Thurman, can you come in and help me? I'll pay you. I said, I don't want any money. How can I help you? And they want me to do all the work. Sorry, I don't work. So uh, they said, then what do, you, what do you want? If you don't want money, what, what do you want? I'm looking for something that is priceless. Success, in my view, is not how many times I visit the garden. Success is how many times I'm not there. And they are succeeding on their own. To me, that is success. As a master gardener. I want to thank Joe, Jessica, Eloy, Pogo, and the Canyon crew for this priceless opportunity to help them help themselves with their journey towards food sovereignty. In behalf of the University of California Master Gardener Program of Riverside County, I'm signing off Thurman Howard, UC Master Gardener. Thank you so much, Howard. All right, if you would like to put your questions in the chat, we will be taking questions now or comments. Um, I will say that, uh, Thurman, we did have a few of like, we need a tour of the garden. So <laughs> some people really want to come see it. The joy of a first harvest was another great comment. And um, we talked earlier this week and, you know, zucchini is always that great piece of uh, garden fruit that is always going to be that I don't know. It's a triumph to uh, to harvest a first zucchini. Um, let me see. Let's we see if we have any questions. We had a lot of people joining us from all over the state. Oh, welcome back, Georgia, into the screen. Um, we had people all the way from <laughs> Sonoma County down in LA, um, Yolo County, Sacramento MGs. Uh, people saying thank you for sharing. Um, we have someone. Uh, joining us from Folsom. So thank you for coming. El Dorado County. Let's see. Oh, we have a lot of thank yous. Oh, and my favorite, we have a thank you with an emoji. So perfect. <laughs> um, one of the things that really stuck out to me uh, throughout your project, and you did not necessarily call it out by name, but you're really creating a sustainable, not only project, but sustainable gardening practices within. So from the outside looking in, I may not know what you're doing, but that's what was going on. And then at the very end, when you wrapped it up of like, you know, now they're, they're helping themselves, they're doing it themselves and educated. Like that to me is really the mission of the Master Gardener Program. No, we're, we we aren't necessarily your workhorse we're your teacher and we can help get you where you want to go mm -hmm. um and through this project too what i also saw and i used to work in a garden that that um was at the mercy of a kitchen 
producing food for a kitchen. And it is great when the chefs know what they want instead of just, you know, for instance, I grow eggplant and I don't like it, but I keep trying to like it. One day I'm going to cook it and like it. I will. So I keep trying. So having the cook direct what's going to be planted and used as real food to feed real people in a community feels really nice and really connects everything back together. And Thurman, you mentioned that this project started in 2019. Was that correct? Yes. Did COVID happen to slow down anything for you guys or the fact that you were working outside? Did that just, did it, did it stall your project at all? It feels like it really kept going. It didn't stall the project. Uh, we lost our Canyon crew. Um, and because the casino that uh, was closed. Mm -hmm. So they had to uh, revisit their budget. And mm -hmm. so it was down to uh, Eloy Pogo and myself, actually. And uh, I, I made more visits there during COVID. Uh, um, and, you know, but it made us stronger. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's better to have less than too much. Yeah, well, great job for making it through that. Um, sometimes, you know, things like that are a hindrance and other times they're an opportunity. So that's great that you guys took the opportunity to keep it going. Um, you did mention that Canyon crew. How many people at any given time were a part of this project? Because I know a lot of well, people well, think it's like one or two people. But by the way, great mm -hmm. photos. You took photos throughout the whole thing. But like we keep seeing people, people, connections. How many do you think were with you? Right. Well, uh, the Canyon crew, I, I'm going to say there were about, uh, I would say, 12. When I first got nice. there, they were all over the place. Uh, there was about 12. Great guys. Some of them were so quiet. Uh, you know, they, they would just wouldn't say anything. And then there was one Canyon crew member, Juice. His name was Julius. We called him Juice. A uh, lot of questions. Mr. Thurman, how come the snake comes to the garden? Why does it come to the garden? And I said, what do you think it comes to the garden? And uh, I don't know. What What do you think? I said, well, maybe because there's water here. Hmm, good idea. Uh, things like that. So, you know, a lot of jovial, a lot of, you know, I, I'm Native Hawaiian. We, we like to talk story. We like to laugh. We like to play. And and that's what I, I experienced there. So it was like going home. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, 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 we have so much fun. It, it, it It's always hugging always, uh, you know, uh, saying, practicing our, our native tongue, if we can, or oh, how do you say this? Or how do you say that? So yeah, it was great. But we had 12. And, uh, but like I said, sometimes too many of them were was hard to manage. Um, and uh, but when COVID came, it, it took them all away, they had to go on other projects. And so um, uh, it was on to three of us, but, you know, it, it, it made the garden um, theirs. Uh, you, you you made me laugh because every time I get a new, like, piece of wildlife in my garden, I joke and I'm like, well, I'd move in here too. Like, <laughs> this is the <laughs> best place. I just gave you food, shelter, water. I mean, it's really nice. I'd move in too if I was a wild animal. <laughs> so I'm never <laughs> mad about it. I just like to laugh at the fact that they've actually just moved in. Um, oh, we have a question coming in. I got it on the. On but I, the I know some of the pictures. If you look at the background and the scenery, yeah. If you look at the background and the scenery, it's just a beautiful place to visit, especially early in the morning. Um, here we go. Congratulations for this enormous accomplishment and for partnering with the Saboba tribe in the way that you did. Can you share your journal category recommendations with us? Couldn't write fast enough. Also, what feedback did you receive at the end of the Saboba tribe in terms of their overall assessment of the project? I, you know, the project is ongoing. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, we just stopped, ended a chapter, but it's, it's continuing. And the success is that they're doing it on their own. And there, uh, and I'm always there. I'm an advisor. Uh, all they have to do is pick up the phone. As a matter of fact, I'll get a phone call at five o'clock in the morning because that's when they start, and we'll go over some issues uh, from time to time. Um, but it's their project. It's it's their it's their path, and, and I'm just proud. And like I say, to be a part of it, it's it's a priceless journey for me. 
The other thing that we've heard that is so uh, fabulous is that many of the tribe members have gone back to their homes and planted home gardens, raised the produce for themselves, for their families, and they keep going back to Eloid and Pogo and the others asking how to do it. So it's teaching from the, the teachers. That's been uh, great. Gar gardening is one catchy. of the things when that I brought up at the fresh tomato. Yeah, once I uh, at the uh, presentation of at Saboba, I, I addressed the uh, tribal council and I and I mentioned the fact that Saboba is now a beacon in the community, not only in the Saboba community, but the uh, okay. community in general that they're the beacon, that people are going to come to them for, for help, and they're going to be the teachers. And that's why it was so important for Eloy to become a, a master gardener. And uh, I, I think this project is going to go above, uh, beyond the reservation and, uh, and will set a great examples for the future. Yeah, I, I agree with that for sure. Georgia, would you feel comfortable pulling up the slide that listed that garden journal information? Sure. Hang on just one second. We'll entertain ourselves while you do that. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, we did drop the link to the blog that um, talks more about the Saboba Cultural Garden winning um, project. So if you would like to go check that out, that is in the comment section. You can click on that link, save it for later, read it before bedtime. George is pulling that up for us now. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us live. We had a bunch of people join us um, partial way through. This is recorded, so you can watch it on YouTube and um, on our Facebook channel, if that's where you're at now. It will be living there. If we have people from the public that joined us, this is just some of the, an example of some of the great projects that we have going around the state. You may even have some um, gardens and projects in your community. So if you'd like to connect with your local Master Gardener program, we'll drop a link in the um, comment section for you to find your local program. Gosh, I forget how many counties we're in now. We just added another one. I think we're in 52 counties in California. Oh, great. I think that is the slide. Georgia, if you want to hit the display or the whole screen. Yep, that is up. So we had a request to show this again. So we're just going to leave it up and we're going to still chat a little bit. Um, Thurman, I think this question is for you. You mentioned calling in favors. It sounds like you are connected in the gardening community. How do you recommend starting to build those connections and or partnerships? Oh, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's just a matter of... Uh, how can I help you and how can you help me? Uh, being a gardener is a specialty, really. Uh, even when I was going, I must have had about six or seven nurses around me asking me questions. <laughs> so uh, it, it is a, it's a unique talent being a gardener. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, it's I scratch your back, you scratch my back. We, you know, I, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, we share knowledge. We share things. Uh, uh, I work with the uh, resource uh, Riverside uh, uh, Natural Resources, uh, which uh, manages the landfill, and they uh, do a lot of composting. And so uh, it, it's just uh, connecting. Um, it, it, it's hard to uh, identify. It's just, we just have a common denominator, and that. Uh, we're always looking out for each other. And when somebody asks for help, I'm always there. And when I ask for help, they're, they always come. Yeah, but it is important as a master gardener to create a network of people. Um, and um, it just comes naturally to me. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. There you go. It comes naturally. You cultivated it. It's there. So I, I've been in business all my life, so maybe that's... Yeah. Yes, it is experience. It is life. Um, so for those of you who want to connect with your local program, I did put up on the screen how you can find your local group. We did have some Master Gardener volunteers that were on the call today or on the live. Um, so 
welcome to that this inspiring project. Um, Riverside County volunteers should be so proud and we're so lucky that this mistake happened. I mean, they didn't know about Master Gardener program, it sounds like. <laughs> and I mean, it's great. It was a happy, what, what do they call it? A happy accident. <laughs> so I, I will take that. And um, I mean, it turned into something it was, it was, so great. It was, uh, it was meant to be. There was a lot of powers be beyond us that it was just meant to be. Yes. It was meant to be. So if anyone would like to follow um, the Riverside um, County social media, we dropped that in the chat so you can follow on their social media. I follow you guys on social media. So I see you um, doing lots of activities and booths and being out in the community. I'm really excited to see where this project goes in the future. Uh, we do have more live events coming up. We have one more. It's going to be in the new year, January. We're going to drop the link to the live series um, in the comment section. But if you missed it, we've already had two lives about our other Search for Excellence winners. They are recorded, so you haven't missed anything. You can go back and listen to them and watch them while you wash the dishes, while you do a run or a walk or garden. <laughs> which we encourage. <laughs> so I wanted to say one more time, thank you so much and congratulations Riverside. We are so happy for you guys and for the impact that you're having not only on a community, but generations. I mean, people going home and gardening, becoming UC Master Gardeners, that's really what we want to see and the continuation of being part of a community that gardens and values and respects. Um, sustainable landscaping practices. It is great. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and close this down. Thank you for everyone for joining us. Take care.